Science faction is not intended for children. But just in case any are listening this episode, we'll try not to say the N-word today. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. And welcome to Science Faction 318, Science Faction, the origin of plants. Now, are we talking plants like vegetables or plants like a mole? Somebody you plant inside an organization to, to help give you an advantage. Uh. No, I was mean like like production plants, like where they build the new Ford Escort. Yeah. Like that's what the, it's going to be. Yeah. Uh, we're more of an engineering podcast. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yep. And speaking of engineering podcasts, I, of course, am your host, comedian archaeologist, Robert Timothy. And with me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing great. I think if we changed our name to an engineering podcast, we actually like science engineering or mm-hmm. something, or, or engineering STEM, faction. STEM podcast? Yeah. But I, I like wanna... engineering faction. That that really... <laughs> <laughs> it's the engineering part, because I, I know that a lot of the autistics listen to science podcasts, and I feel like if we brand ourselves as a train podcast yeah like we're all engineers choo choo they love being called stupid fucking hats (laughs) they love being called the autistics too by the way like they're a 1950s band we know we know for a fact that the autisms have trouble knowing when they're the butt of a joke in fact they have to be flowers for algernon in order for them it's almost cruel to teach them about society (laughs) and someone who knows all about society is none other than our scientist for the afternoon bill bill how you doing I'm doing pretty good. I recently moved into a new house, which is great because I can now bike to work. But I also don't have internet or washing machine. So you moved into a tent? Yeah. (laughs) With a bike? (laughs) Right. You just moved into the woods? You're just like, (laughs) I put a tent on the back of my bike. I would argue that unless you were commuting to work from Hawaii then biking was always an option. It was just a question of laziness. That's true. That's true. I would have had to bike 20 miles a day at the old place, though. And now it's six miles a day, which is totally managed. Of all of our guest scientists, you were the only one who I think would do... If you told me I bike 20 miles to and from work every day, (laughs) you're the only one. I have done it, just not every day. Well, Bill, from now on, you have to bike here. There's, (laughs) I am tired of your carbon footprint really just screwing up. Yeah. Yeah. The Prius really guzzles gas. Yeah, absolutely. Whereas Bobby takes his personal helicopter to to the studio (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, sometimes I just do a couple of laps, too, around the neighborhood, you know, just to to test it out. Want to keep your pilot sharp. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) All right, and today we are talking about the origin of plants. So let's start off with, what do you guys think a plant is? Like, if you had to define a plant to an alien who just crash-landed on Earth, what what would you define a plant as? Any non-swamp thing creature that Mm -hmm. photosynthesizes. Okay, so to you, anything that photosynthesizes that's not swamp thing, that's a plant. Wait, I would swamp argue that thing swamp... photosynthesizes? Yeah, he's dude, green. for sure. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I've never seen him eat a steak. All right. <laughs> I hang with that dude on the wreck. <laughs> I mean, if he didn't photosynthesize, like you'd kind of be a lame superhero, right? Wait, because it's wait, like why does he have I have all the ability of plants, like not moving and flowering. Yeah, he's huh. he's essentially all the uncool parts about Superman. I'm powered by the sun. Yeah. <laughs> but that's where it stops. That's right. All right, Bill, what's your plant definition? Uh, okay, so there are plants, animals, fungi. What are the other two? It's protozoan. There are. There are. Is that one of the five kingdoms? No, so what is the other one? Anyways, Archaea. my point being, I don't know exactly what distinguishes fungi from plants, but I'm certain that there are cell characteristics that are different between mm-hmm. plants and animals. Do um, fungi photosynthesize? I don't think so, but I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure that there are algae that if photosynthesize? They, if they didn't, they wouldn't be a fun guy. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, it's a Swamp Thing reference. <laughs> swamp Thing is actually a redneck dude from Florida. He chugs beers. You could see Swamp Thing regularly go to NASCAR races. Right. Yeah, okay, so something about cells. I'm going to say cell walls. Something, we'll, just, we'll just go something about cells. Hey, I'm not a biologist. Remember that Ben Stiller movie from the 90s, Something About Cells? <laughs> Fuck mitochondria. <laughs> yeah, so... Very interesting. So, g- interesting definitions. For the record, 
while plants do photosynthesize, they are not the only things that photosynthesize. Like Bill just mentioned, there are bacterial groups that photosynthesize. There are lichen, which is like this weird hybrid that essentially photosynthesizes. It's a mixture of cyanobacteria and like a, a plant and an algae. There are algaes that photosynthesize. And very interestingly, there's actually a few animals that photosynthesize. What? Yeah, I didn't know this either until I started researching plants. This is a Swamp enough. Thing reference. Yeah. We're just getting right back to Swamp <laughs> Thing. No, so there's four that are kind of considered the mainstay that do it in two different ways. So one way, which is done by the sea slug, as well as a species of salamander. So this is actually a vertebrate in that sense. And I think there was something else that did this as well. They do it by eating things that photosynthesize, usually algae. Wait, that sounds no, like no, a no. cop out. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> they eat the things that photosynthesize and they have a special type of stomach that allow the chloroplasts within these algae to leak through their stomach into their body and continue photosynthesizing in the Whoa. new organism. That's cool. Super cool. So there's a sea slug and a salamander that I know that do this. Lizards, frogs, salamanders, they're all part of this group of animals that if you just said like... Did you know that, and pick one of the, the three from that group, Yeah, can actually control metal with their mind? And like, people would <laughs> yeah, just... You, totally you, believe you. Yeah. fucking monitor lizards. That's, yeah. that's what they do. You probably believe it. But if <laughs> I said, like, did you know that there's a species of arboreal sloth that can we, do the exact same shit? You guys yeah. would be like, get the fuck yeah, out of here. You know that snakes have teeth in their asshole? Yeah. <laughs> we did find out there are snakes with weird teeth in places. Yeah, sideways teeth. Not yeah. quite teeth in the asshole, though. Whatever. There is that method of animals doing it. There's another one. There's an interesting wasp that has a very, very weird system whereby part of its abdomen has a particular material that grows on it. It photosynthesizes in a different way. It doesn't absorb it and then use chlorophyll and break it down. It actually creates an electrical current. So it creates an electrical distinction, basically like a solar cell between one material type on its abdomen and another. And then releases these like electrical charges as part of its way of like stimulating growth in in like the young wasp nest. It's, wow. So that one is super interesting too. So there are animals that that literally photosynthesize. So it's like doing that like transcranial current thing yeah. to its youngins. Yeah, to I'm going to make you smart. Yeah, I'm imagining like kind of like a static electricity yeah. sort of thing like if your dad like Ran on a rug with socks the on only and then like zapped you in the head and that was your, your training. Yeah, something. very very similar, except you do it by charging up in the sun, right? So this yeah. isn't a kinetic energy thing that's knocking off ions and creating a, a right. static charge. This is like literally photons. the photons are yeah. hitting it and charging you up. I mean, really, when the rubber meets the road, is that how they use it to correct the young? Like, like what's <laughs> no, no, how is no. this electricity? It's, no, they're like actually like using spankings. It, they're using it as like an energy source to basically deliver. Power the lights. It. Yeah, exactly. Hey, <laughs> that's why you hook up some Junkoor cables to some wasps. It's like that old potato experiment. When you say plants, in general, you're actually usually talking about a really specific group of land-based organisms, the vascular plants that live on land. So most of the time when you're saying plants, you're not actually referring to things like green algae, which you could consider in the plant family if you broadened it enough, but that's not actually what plants generally means. See, I grew up in a more tolerant family, and we kind of looked at seaweed as plants too. Right. Like we didn't draw those distinctions. Like uh -huh. Green lives matter? Yeah. <laughs> Swampy lives matter. Yeah. Listen, uh, I know that kelp in your house had to drink out of a separate water fountain, but... <laughs> <laughs> if we were to just talk about photosynthesis as like a definition of plant and figure out where that is, we know that photosynthesis has been going on for about 3 billion years. Now, we don't know that that thing that whatever is photosynthesizing is what we would consider a plant today or if it's even in the lineage of what plants are today. Maybe it went extinct. We do know that there was something photosynthesizing, though, because a very interesting property of our Earth, which is once you had photosynthesis, remember photosynthesis is what produced oxygen. There was no free oxygen before that. So this is a creature that's taking in the CO2 and the environment around it and, and putting out oxygen. Once that happened, free oxygen began combining with iron in the early oceans and basically, similar to rust, pulling that iron out of the water and then that iron would fall to the bottom in sediment layers. And we actually have these dark banded sediment layers on the bottom of the ocean when photosynthesis started happening. So we can kind of measure through the Earth's history when photosynthesis started taking place because it leaves this telltale mark on the ocean floor. So that started happening about 3 billion years ago, so a long time ago. The type of thing that we would consider an ancestral plant, we don't see evidence of in the fossil record till about a billion years ago. And then, even then, it's not in on land yet. The type of thing that we would consider a real plant didn't really come around until about 850 million years ago. So in that sense, 
old, right? Old, kind of old, yeah. but still, you know. Did we have to... vertebrates at that point? No. So this is Precambrian. Okay. So it took all of this time for the plant to grow up to be the bitch of all species that it is today. Like <laughs> I don't every know. animal eats plants. Um, but are they are How they many the plants bitch? Eat animals? They outnumber us though, right? So like if they outnumber us, aren't by they kind of winning? So do insects, or... but I would never call insects a bitch. <laughs> okay. They will rule the world. You're right. They plants will. will never plants rule the world. are kind of the same way. If you think about it, plants are the only ones who don't give a f- they don't need us. Right, like any other right, thing, true. you take animals We're not part out of their life cycle. No, you take animals out of, or uh, you take one specific animal out of the food chain, or plants themselves out of the food chain. We're all fucked, right? But we all die, and most plants, with the exception of some that need pollinators and stuff, all the animals on Earth could die, and most plants would be like, "Fuck yes, it's ours, sweet mom's gone, let's throw a party." <laughs> the lamest ass planet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> So what are some interesting qualities that plants have? Well, they can do a bunch of interesting stuff that we cannot. Number one, they can produce either sexually, like flowering pollen, or asexually. They can actually reproduce themselves or clone themselves, some of them, from just a graft, meaning you cut a branch off and you stick it in the ground and it can grow. Some plants can do that. That'd be pretty cool. Like you could chop your arm off, stick it in the ground, and all of a sudden another you grew out of it. Right, and those are genetically identical, right? Yes. So that, that's like cloning. Yeah, exactly. Yourself. Yeah, but so so is it when they reproduce asexually? It right. would be a practice done primarily by forty year old women who was like, "Well, it's now or never." Now uh, I gotta have not, something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not having kids. So when Janet shows shows up to work with one arm, yeah, it wouldn't just be them. Yeah. It would be every one of us who's like, you know what? I really can use like four extra hands, but uh, so helping. D- do you grow do we, back? Yeah, do we grow that? I mean, yes, yeah. we gain yeah. a hand each yeah. time. Well, yeah, because sure, the plant yeah, you grows. Lose one, get two. Right. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> so here's a great example that I guess if you had to chop off your arm and the arm doesn't grow back, but the arm grows into another person, would you do it? No, absolutely uh, not. Because if the person's a clone, it'd be weird. Right. They're technically better than you now, right? Like, you've created a clone that's better than you because it's got two arms. Oh, my God. I'm, like, in combat. Like, I, like I'm useless. Yeah. It also might be – is it going to be younger? Like, no, a, no, no. a new tree – is that – would you call, like, a grafted mm. tree the same age as yeah, the original that's a good, tree? No, no, no. We're going to have to set the rule that it's the age you are when you cut the arm off. Here's the thing. You're also going to be a new parent for a long time with just one arm. Like, in order yeah. to bring this thing into maturity. No, I'm imagining it, it grows like Deadpool. Like, it's a little weird for the first few days, but it's essentially a full <laughs> human at the end. Okay. Okay. Well, then here's the thing, because I was thinking that maybe we could just, you know, who's to say, who's to say you don't, you don't use your arm, you know? But within a few days, you would know, like somebody would know, that's not your son, that's not your fake son, that's Louis Anderson's fake son. <laughs> or you Where's could create, you could create your own army if you just continued to do one arm off each clone, right? So like each clone, you just cut one arm off, and that's going to be the next clone. And you just keep going the entire way. I would like to try some experiments. Like, are lefty bobbies different than righty bobbies, right? So you just keep cutting one different arm off each time. I like how you're creating your army of the unsullied. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I've never fought an army of one armed men. I'm thinking you cut both your arms off. Uh And then the right-handed children, you then also cut both of their arms off to make the new side. But then the left-armed children get to keep their arms. Okay. Half of your self-populated society has all their arms. Right. And the other ones are just used to make new whole-armed people. Now I'm getting my MBA here, and we're learning about cost and waste. <laughs> now it seems like your program seems to have at least a 50% refuse problem. <laughs> yeah. We need to figure out a way to use those practices. So can we sell them to some sort of soccer nation? <laughs> can <Yeah>. we? <laughs> this this yeah. cost has to become <laughs> Right. We profit. just need to work really hard on prosthetics. Yeah. Yeah, or they're just like, they have a job that they'd be good at. Shoe testing. Like, they'd be... <laughs> well, once we... I mean, really, once we get to the point where robot arms are better than yeah. human arms, why yeah. not yeah. cut off both arms? Yeah, that's why, like, all of a sudden, Luke's sacrifice didn't seem so big, you know, in the yeah. next movie, because you're like, your arm's way better. Yeah. Like, is... <laughs> yeah, you could uh, punch out a Wookiee now, whereas yeah. you couldn't before. <laughs> So they can do these really neat things. They can, you know, reproduce from a graft. They can travel literally over oceans. I mean, think about it. The reason Hawaii has a whole bunch of plants but no endemic mammals other than bats is because we can't fucking get to the middle of nowhere, but plants can. Plants go on the seas. Plants fly through the air. Plants do all this stuff and colonize the most distant places of the earth. Excuse me. What else does Hawaii have that completely destroys your argument? Oh, yeah. Polynesians. That's true. Polynesians have no reason to be on that island. That is a bullseye on a dartboard that's the size yeah. of the country. Yeah. No. They, well, that is, I'm not going to argue with that. Yeah. They're also, I mean, I guess this is bigger philosophical argument, but are they consciously moving around? 
The like, Polynesians? I don't know. I've never no, asked no, one. The plants. You're right. That is, a, the... that is a pretty philosophical <laughs> argument. It's hard. <laughs> well, I guess we'll never know. <laughs> How the fuck are you going to talk to one of those guys? <laughs> For the for last lizard people, <laughs> for the last time, we're not talking about boy. <laughs> uh, no, no. Of course, I was talking about plants. Are they are they sentient? Sure, Do they know like when they're being eaten? If I have a carrot, is it like angry at me? The thing until you you said sentient. That would have been way funnier and more racist. I'm gonna go ahead and say. This isn't a very broad philosophical question, and the answer is no. I'm going to just I'm gonna jump out and jump and say that, because uh, they have no neurons, nor brains, nor structure to know things. So, uh, <laughs> Could you argue that some of the carnivorous plants, on enough time, could have the necessary, absorb the necessary proteins to develop? Yeah, because that's how it works. When you eat something... <laughs> <laughs> we talked about a salamander that got superpowers from a fucking plant. Don't you fucking talk to me about that. <laughs> So that's right. So if you can, yeah, the plant it, eats eats like my brain and yes. absorbs the brain into its skin, and yeah. then it starts thinking, "What that's don't the way it eat works?" Me. To this logic, a Venus flytrap would eat a fly and start to transform into Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> yes. <laughs> also, Damien, if this logic was true, you would just be one huge bag of semen. <laughs> <laughs> Those burrito hands on that bag of semen? <laughs> he does not eat well. That bag of semen has IBS. Oh, uh, yeah, indeed. So so there's some research that gets way overblown where people go, look, we just found out plants are conscious because uh, we see this cascade and this calcium channels when this plant gets hurt and things change. Fun fact, overblown is how you become a bag of semen. <laughs> But the reality is that is not consciousness. The ability to send a signal is not consciousness. Otherwise, a telephone wire is conscious, right? So indeed, we see calcium channels open up when and plants send signals to themselves and then an interconnected network sometimes to even other plants around them based on these opening and closing of calcium or ion channels that can do anything from change the way a plant tastes to uh, have it secrete poisonous chemicals, et cetera, et cetera. That's not consciousness, though, right? That's just the relaying of a signal, which they can do. And that is interesting and something that we've only discovered in the last 15 or 20 years. That is super interesting. Consciousness would have to be awareness of oneself. And I think we can all agree that there can be no awareness of oneself if you have no awareness to have, right? So you have to have a brain to have any kind of awareness. You have to have some kind of processing to be able to process, I guess. But I mean, if there's signals being exchanged and then a decision is made based on the information relayed by those signals. No, see, you 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 already you're begging the question a little bit with that by saying a decision is made. So there isn't necessarily a decision made, that signal triggers an event to happen. So that doesn't have to be a decision that gets made any more than the phone isn't deciding to ring when it gets the signal through it. It's just yeah. what happens when a phone gets a signal. Right. But like you could argue that when a human is given a bunch of photons in the form of an image yep. and then reacts to that image, mm -hmm. it's a more complicated process for right. sure. But there might be a, a very similar reactions going on inside your brain that you're not really in control of. Sure. I'm, I'm a determinist. I would believe in that. It's just that those reactions is what we call consciousness, right? So like the reactions within that brain are what we define as consciousness. So without a brain how would you be able to be conscious, right? So how would you be able to think about anything without a brain? With a cephalopod tentacle system. Yeah, well... Uh, a <laughs> sensual cephalopod <laughs> tentacle system. Quick, get that URL right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's taken, but it's in Japanese. I feel like that's like cellar door, like one of those nice sounding... Phrases. Ce cephalopod yeah, tentacle. Yeah, sensual <laughs> cephalopod tentacle system. I'm telling you, that is the name of a door-to-door -door escort service in Japan. I have, I've never been to Tokyo. I've never been stepped foot on, on the island of Japan. Yeah. <laughs> but I guarantee you that exists. So uh, we obviously live symbiotically with plants. Like we talked about, plants are one of those things that could live without us, but we could not live without them. They produce not only our food supply, because they are literally, if you want to get down to it, think of what plants are. Plants are solar panels that make food. And they make the food systems that every single one of us are dependent on. I'm not saying you have to be a vegan. Anything. Anything you eat comes from plants. All that energy is originally captured as sunlight and then turned into energy that we can eat, chemical energy that we can eat, by plants. And there's nothing else that is doing that. We had Science Faction, The Brain, mm -hmm. a couple episodes back. And I believe Dr. Troy called The Brain there a meat computer. Right. That sounds so dirty, whereas... Plants are essentially 
what do you say? Solar panels that make food. Yeah, solar panels that make food. Yeah. That that's plants are better than us in that in the- True, true. But meat computers still didn't sound as gross as comeback. <laughs> <laughs> Which I transformed myself into when I was cursed by a homophobic witch. <laughs> <laughs> so plants, super, super interesting, the basis of all life on earth to the extent that bacteria and stuff are not, but very much what allows other life to exist and form, and in these very wide ranges of stuff. So even take out, let's just say we're talking about typical plants, so you're not having green algae, you're not having uh, some of the kind of fringe plant groups. We're just you're talking still about... still not even going to say kelp. You're no, just like, no, 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 no. Trees, yeah, like so, bushes. Yeah, so think of that variation. Grasses. Think, think of like how similar most looking most animals are. You know, most land animals are tetrapods, basically. We're just walking around. Some of us went up on two legs, but we're basically the same body type. Most of us are vertebrates. Most of us have some pretty similar qualities. And outside of Goro, there's really no example of (laughs) creatures that break that. (laughs) Think of the difference between a grass and a redwood, right? Like, think of the difference between, like, a lichen, which is actually a hybrid between a plant and cyanobacteria, and a cactus, you know? Yeah. It's such a huge variation. The shape, the size, the body mass index, like every little bit of it, everything is so different and so varied. They live in climates that are up at the top of 15,000 foot mountains and they live all the way bottom in the bottom of Death Valley. They can do this wide variety of things. They can live way longer than animals can. The bristlecone pine lives over 5,000 years, right? Yeah. They can do all of this stuff. In some sense, they can be almost immortal. We talked about the grove of aspen, aspen trees. It's a whole bunch of trees. It's thousands of trees, but it's one living organism and they're all connected by roots and they're all all essentially clones of one another. Doesn't have a creepy name. Yeah, I forgot what it was though. And it's a lot. It's been alive for fourteen. We think maybe fourteen thousand years. Shredding the slopes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just they're so different than us. If you did not know about plants and you were just living in an animal world, again, couldn't exist because that's where we get all our food energy from. <laughs> but if you did, they would seem like a weird ass alien to us because they're just so different. Proud that we made it through an origin to plant episodes without bringing a pot one time. Yep, not a single time. All right, let's move right on <laughs> to science articles. In a couple days, it'll be 420. From molecules to particles, this is science articles. All right, article number one a new hominid. Super interesting, guys. I love this. Uh, you, I, my background is in physical anthropology before I got into archaeology. So to me, like, there is nothing more interesting than a new hominid. So like you were taking like a really exciting field and you said, you know what? I'm tired of all this. Let's slow things down a bit. I want to learn a less exciting, more boring field. Archaeology uh, ho. First of all, archaeology ho. You you you, ah! <laughs> which is what they called you when you pledged your archaeological fraternity. <laughs> Archaeology they have those? <laughs> Archaeology ho is the is the chick that just hangs around digs trying to <laughs> just <laughs> what, like like an archaeologist groupie. Yeah, exactly. She's like, can I carry the screens? <laughs> oh Give us some archaeological catcalling. Like something that, that she would scream at the hot piece of archaeological ass walking to the site. Uh baby, let me see that Marshall Town. Marshalltown, by the way, is the brand of the trowels that you use. Oh, it's uh, like it's the okay. Mercedes Benz of trowels, yeah. if you will. Like if, if you were, were in a, it's like the equivalent of some sweet Nikes. If you yeah, if you like were that. in an archaeology rap video, you, the Marshalltown emblem would be like the Bentley emblem. You know, you uh-huh. throw it up. Uh, I'm trying to think. What is what? your grill like? Do you have? Uh... It would be the screen, of course. You'd yeah. have to have a good, yeah, <laughs> good screen. I'm trying uh, to have like a sexual thing about digging, but I really don't want to dig ooh, during but sex. Brushing, <laughs> brushing. Yeah. What about like tantalizing brushing? Want to yeah. clean my asshole, baby. <laughs> I was thinking more than nipples, but sure. <laughs> you want to clean these dirty ass nipples? Yeah, that's hot. You know I, want to, I, mean? <laughs> I want to get all over your one by one unit. <laughs> Why don't you leave something so deep in me that only future generations will find? Wow. <laughs> I measure your dick size in inches because this shit's getting historical. <laughs> it's a really deep archaeology joke. <laughs> I gave a fake laugh. Yeah. <laughs> but I, you know what? I'm not even going against you on this because. Human paleontology is actually super interesting. It is probably one of the only disciplines that is more interesting than archaeology itself. And that is because human paleontology is so rare, so focused, so important to the story of our unique shared history, the history of humankind, and so fucking fascinating. Like, to me, new hominid species are so important because we have so few of them. There's only about two dozen known hominid species, depending on how you want to draw the lines and where you want to define it. 
And we can only find them in very specified locations. It's a really unique science, too, because usually they're only dealing with one or two remains that one specific group gets to study, and then they have to tell the rest of us about it. You know, it's not like physics where you can make the same discovery at CERN or at some other nuclear research facility. You can only work on what you have. You can only be the one working on it if you are the one who has rights to work on that specific set of remains. And so it's this weird almost like mysterious thing that gets funneled down to us, but it's the history of every single one of us. I think we're all very grateful that the Leakey family grew up in Eastern Africa. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, that that all those finds would have been lost to time. Possibly, possibly, or they would have gotten discovered by somebody who's uh, more qualified than those assholes. But regardless. <laughs> Wait, so how does that work? Like when a group makes a find, yeah. they are the only ones who get to study those fossils until unless they're they done share with it. it. Unless they share it, right? Why do people not share it? So a lot of the testing you're going to do is destructive. So only uh, one group can do, you know, the C14 testing. I see. And then oftentimes, you know, you want to be the first to publish. So a lot of times when, the, and we'll talk about this with this species, stuff is found. And then it will be a decade or more before it gets written up because you have to do such detailed work. You have to go back and do more digs. You have to compare it to other fossils and other collections. And it takes a very long time to declare a new species. So most of these groups are just like looking for some big find most of the time. Yes. And it's only like one of the groups that actually is doing the lab work yeah. and at so any there's one a, time. There's a lot of different ways this can happen. So if you're Tim White, who is my instructor, is the greatest paleoanthropologist to have ever lived, <coughs> described more species than everything. He's the guy who originally described Lucy. He discovered... I'm more of a leaky man myself. Because yeah, I, I, I you have a shitty... <laughs> all of them yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah, all of them together. You know, between all the leakies, between like the four of them that worked in human family anthropology. They're all qualified leakies, by one, the way. One of them had a degree. One of them. Okay. Meve was the only one. But uh, regardless of that, so what would happen is if you're someone like Tim White, you go out to Olduvai Gorge, you walk around, you're really good at finding these fossils and you find them. That's one way to do it. If you're these guys, you're actually just doing regular work, regular archaeology work somewhere, and you usually only go down a certain depth. And then at some point, somebody goes, Actually, we found another island hominid, Homo floresiensis, about 10 years ago, maybe, maybe 15 now, 15 years ago. Uh, maybe you should dig a little deeper, which is what these guys did. They had already excavated this cave to, I think, like a meter and a half, two meters, and had excavated down through the Homo sapien levels. Then they decided to keep going even deeper, and that's when they found some of these remains. Super interesting. So in 2007, they initially found a piece that they went, this looks like a really weird distorted bone. But we guess it must be Homo sapien. It carbon dated to like 67,000 years ago. Okay, fine. It looks Homo. It, we'll just keep it in there. Uh, so they, of course, publish. They say my dad used to say something pretty similar to me every day before I left the house. He would, <laughs> wouldn't refer to me as Damien. He'd say it looks Homo, yeah. and then he'd say, greet my brothers and sisters and send them off to school. <laughs> Still sounds better than burrito-handed comeback. <laughs> <laughs> you work your way up to that yeah. in life. Yeah. As, you're calling the episode, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So as time went on, they found a few more remains super deep in, and they realized, oh man, it looks like we have a new species, because they didn't match any of the known species of hominids. Some really interesting mixtures of traits. So the bones that we have are some teeth, some toe bones, and some finger bones, and part of a femur. And so when they first found these, they looked at it and they went, wait a second, the fingers and toes are curled too much. Like the foot bones and the hand bones are curled too much. And this like is. Like they got their first kiss or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and they're just curling their toes. <laughs> they, uh, this kind of curvature is indicative of arboreal lifestyles. And the thing is, Homo basically lost this a long time ago. And if this. And creature... by arboreal lifestyles, mean swinging from trees. Exactly, right? And so. So because Homo erectus was like such a successful hominid, it was the first one that we know for sure made it out of Africa, it spread well through the old world. So it was prominent in Africa, then it spread through Europe, then it spread into Asia, Southeast Asia, made it down into the Indonesian islands and became Homo floresiensis, which is another small hominid we have there. Because we believe that this likely came from that particular hominid, it was weird to see it with these curved feet and hands because that actually predates Homo erectus. Homo erectus had a had feet and hands much like our own. So why do we think that it came from Homo erectus if it's like redeveloped these curved fingers? Because that's the only real candidate for what it could have come from. So what's interesting is if we're looking at this as being really old, and we do have evidence on this island that was just published last year in 2018 of a 700,000-year-old 
uh, rhino kill site with stone tools there. So something killed and cut up this rhino. We don't know what it was. We don't have the remains of that particular individual, but it was likely Homo erectus because we know Homo erectus was around uh, at that time. That was super interesting to find that out because this particular island, unlike Flores in Indonesia, this island was never connected to the mainland. So the second we found that, we knew, holy shit, some hominid took a boat here or a raft or got washed up or something. Domesticated sea lions. <laughs> right. Just got a saddle technology. It was yeah, really yeah. good. You could get a few of them, like hook yeah. them up to a boogie board. So that, that was super interesting because we didn't think they necessarily had that technology. So that was already neat in and of itself. But what tends to happen is a hominid gets caught on an island. So in the case of Homo floresiensis, that was a Homo erectus, got, was uh, kind of in around that area as sea levels rose the island of Flores formed, so it found itself trapped on an island, and it, what happened to it is what happens to a lot of large mammals when they get trapped on islands, which is they shrink. Uh, just like the elephants on the same island of Flores shrank to be like the size of kind of big dogs, uh, these guys, these humans shrank to be about three to four feet tall. We think that's the same thing that happened here, but separately, because these don't look, look like Flores. They look to be about the same size, three to four feet. We think we're doing this by dentition, so we're not sure yet. But they also have some very interesting tooth differentials as well. So one is they seem to have two or three roots on their premolars, which is weird because that's also a really ancient adaptation that is not around in the Homo sapiens or Homo erectus, but also their teeth are small, especially their molars. Small molars are a super advanced feature in the Homo species. So our ancient ancestors had huge giant teeth. They tend to get smaller and smaller as they go because on. Because of the stuff they need to eat, yeah, like exactly. tubers or yeah. something. Yeah, because they're doing a lot of crunching and stuff like that. Once you get up, especially as you start eating meat, you don't need that as much. And especially as you start wielding fire, which we know Homo erectus did, you definitely don't need that, that as much. And the teeth get smaller and smaller and smaller. Well, these ones seem to have the smallest molars that we've ever seen before. So it's this it weird mixture. creepy when he smiled. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a weird mixture of super old traits and super new traits that are around in this one thing. Now, we don't know brain volume. We don't know intelligence. We don't have a lot of information on this thing. All we when know is- When you say it's a, old and new, are, are our mouths referred to, is that- is that what you yep. refer to as new? Is weird that we have the newest model of mouse. Yeah. We have the smallest molars out there. Absolutely. We got like the the uh, electric plug-in mouth, if you will. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, that's all right. But so uh, this new hominid has smaller molars than us? Yeah, yeah, and that's not necessarily surprising given its physical size. So right. like Flores has small molars. It has molars that are even smaller than Flores, though. Okay. So super, super interesting in that sense. We know that there's at least two adults and one juvenile that's represented by the cur current fossil assemblage that span at least 20,000 years. So this was a species that lived a decent amount of time in this one cave. Is it weird that I had no idea about this hominid? I had no idea about the fact that small molars uh, existed. Uh, but now that I know that small molars are uh, a method we use to determine how advanced a hominid is, I'm a little jealous that... <laughs> That it's got smaller molars, by a, yeah. By yeah. some punk-ass extinct hominid <laughs> out there in the Philippines. Yeah. Are there a lot of trees on this island? Yeah. Like what? Okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So and, maybe. And probably was even more so back in the day. It probably has a very similar look to Floresiensis, probably small. Again, probably spent a lot of time in the trees, but it came from a species, most likely Homo erectus, that did not spend time in the trees. Right. That's it's so like it, the whole name thing is like we're yeah. standing erect. We're well, and these, the these guys were too. These were bipedal erect things, but they were probably also spending a decent amount of time in the trees. And that was a reversion. So they went from, you know, Africa being in the trees, then savannas walking around, Homo erectus walking around upright, not really spending a lot of time in the trees, to going back into the trees when they got isolated on this island. Hmm. I assume it was an adapter for being able to like knock out pull ups like crazy. Like, if, like yeah, if, if working you... on the lats. The okay. lats are like a big, big sexual organ for them. Sorry, Bobby. Uh, if you look at his lats and back, you could tell he's never done a pull up in his life. <laughs> That's right. Right. Bill and I, you're going to have a talk. You and I are going to have a talk about lat health later. <laughs> oh yeah. And so we don't cut. <laughs> we don't know what happened to this particular species except that it went extinct. There's no evidence that it interbred into the modern human populations there. But super interesting, this is, by the way, the first major new species discovered in a long time since I think it, since probably Homo nadelli, which was a South African species. Ironically, Homo nadelli also shares some weird mixtures of features that look really recent and really old at the same time. That's an African species from about 200 some odd thousand years ago. 
So the idea is that ancient humans may have had this weird mixture of features. We can't always think of it as a linear relationship of non-advanced to advanced because clearly there is this weird variety and we just happen to be the ones that made it and survived. But it's always interesting to me to think about those times when you were, let's say you were a human and you were going, you know, we know by this time the uh, ancestors of current Aboriginal Australians were making their way through the islands. Now, they may not have gone on this specific island, but maybe they did, right? Think of what it is to be them. They are walking around in a world that's just filled with different types of human beings. You know, big barrel-chested Neanderthals with giant ass heads, Homo erectus running around, just fucking shit up. You're terrified of that group of people <laughs> who don't get near those. Tiny little hobbits running around, different ones on different islands. Just such a weird thing to think about. I always compare it to the Lord of the Rings, right? Go over that hill and there's giants. Go over that hill and there's dwarves. Don't fuck with those guys over there. They're mean. Like, it would just be a weird thing to live in a world where there were different species of humans running around with you. So Homo erectus was, I mean, they were like the orcs is what you're saying? Like, like they, yeah, they likely hunt, there. They likely hunted. Like, there's, oh, we, they definitely hunted, yeah. We don't have evidence of Ooh, the Homo o- Orukai, right? Because yeah. they're standing up. Yeah. They're like they're big. Half-breeds. They're walking around. Yeah. <laughs> they're terrifying. Like, if you were being hunted by a group of homo erectus good luck i always say like fuck jurassic park they should do pleistocene park where you're you're basically being hunted by groups like homo erectus because they're you know not nearly as intelligent as us their brain size is not nearly as big as ours but their body is pretty much the same they had fire they had spears they had hunting technology they hunted efficiently in packs they were i always say they're the most successful hominid species because they were around for at least a million years and their descendants are us and so if you're around for a million years as a species that's at least 700,000 years longer than our own species has been around and maybe longer than we will last. <laughs> and so like to, they have been incredibly successful species and they did so by being ruthless, brutal group pack hunters. And if you were being chased by a group of Homo erectus, good fucking luck. I'm a concealed carry permit. I'm not worried. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we, we probably recorded a red state. No, I mean, we, we have no evidence as far as I know of conflict, direct physical confrontation between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals or or Denisovans, correct? We don't. It would be pretty crazy to imagine there wasn't, though. Well, I mean, the point is, like, were there were these two cooler with each other, or did they, or did, or were the Homo? Do the, is the reason the Homo erectus didn't exist anymore is because they couldn't? Did they have to be driven from the land by, uh, like, uh-huh. how come there are no more Homo erectus if they were such a successful hunter? Well, there's no more any other species except us, right? So, so they, the others bred in. Some, some did, some did not, uh, and you know the vast majority of them obviously went extinct because there's only a few interbreeding events but also they were very very good hunters but it doesn't mean that they're going to adapt well for instance to something like the changing climate and it also doesn't mean that they're going to adapt well to a species like our own which is more intelligent kind of moving in still terrifying though but what what is interesting is they were so successful they made their way off to these far off islands in at least two cases now uh flores and now here in the philippines they shrunk down to a small size That is just so weird. Could you imagine? Again, these aren't chimps. They're not walking around on their knuckles. This is a fully upright walking stone tool making human being. Could you imagine just landing on an island 50,000 years ago and just seeing a small little dude run after you with a spear and be like, I got the wrong fucking island. God damn. How well do you think an MMA fighter would fare? Like in that situation do you feel like like there do you feel like a homo erectus are they as susceptible to an arm bar as well this would not have been the homo erectus remember this would have been a, a small miniaturized version of oh, it okay mm. but they clearly have that sweet upper body strength meant for our bill boreal living i'm That's saying true. could you put that in an arm bar yeah totally you could and you're just you could just kick them in the face because <laughs> <laughs> size of a five-year-old you know Anyway, are you saying you kick five year olds in the face? <laughs> yeah, if I got to. Yeah, I was training to come to this island for years, <laughs> uh, and it bears repeating just uh, for our, our fans to think of about this kind of hominid lineage. So think if you're of kicking what... a five year old in the face. Dial back at first. You don't realize how soft those face buttons yeah, are. Yeah, well, and also go front kick. It's the easy one that they can't catch. So, uh, <laughs> so, so let's think about how this works. So you're in Africa. Four some odd million years ago, you're still in Australopithecines, which are basically chimps that walk upright. So they have full upright walking, but they're not really have a brain capacity much bigger than chimps. They're probably not doing anything much more advanced than chimps. We have no evidence of stone tool making up so until a, the very end of them. So it's a chimp. The only difference is it really just displays its genitals. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then as time goes on, we have different species of Australopithecines. We have Afarensis, Africanus. 
uh, Anamensis, and then we get up to the later ones like Australopithecus garhi that may have, may have started to make stone tools, and that slowly transitions kind of seamlessly into Homo habilis, which is kind of an arbitrary difference. They're very, very similar. We just have to say this brain size is the difference between Homo and Australopithecines, but really it's just an arbitrary difference as to where that is. Long story short, the brain size starts getting really, really big at some point, and we see st stone tool making going on at some point, and these things are still small, though. They're still in the four to five foot range. Then all of a sudden, as Homo habilis slowly becomes Homo erectus, it shoots up. We have six foot tall individuals running around, and that's when shit gets real, because these guys can see over the grasses. They, they have can the, dunk. They can. They have the <laughs> body mass to fight off larger animals. They start creating spears. They use fire, and they spread out of Africa, and they just fucking go buck wild. So and from Homo erectus, you get... Uh, their descendant species, which is Homo heidelbergensis, which is the basically the ancestor of us, Neanderthals, Denisovans, all of those groups. And home, uh, that group spreads into Europe, and in Europe evolves into Neanderthals and Denisovans, and stays in Africa and evolves into us, Homo sapiens. We then spread out eventually, 100,000 years ago or so, into the rest of the old world, and only successfully do so about 70,000 years ago, and then more successfully in a separate event about 45,000 years ago, and come into contact with these things that we've been separated from for hundreds of thousands of years. In doing so, we interbreed at least three times with Denisovans, at least twice with Neanderthals, and at least once with another now unknown species of hominid. But other than that, imagine these spreading conflicts. Imagine these groups of Homo sapiens fighting a group of Neanderthals or Denisovans or one of these little guys. It's so weird to think about. And that entire history happened in just the right way, so we're all sitting here right now. But it could have been the Neanderthals. It could have been the Denisovans that made it. It you didn't know, have to be us. I don't know. Let's go to the, we're going to have to go to the multiverse to really yeah. check this one out. Well, I mean, I, I like to think that if we just happened to be in the right cycle where we had a little bit longer of an ice age where they had an advantage over us, you know, we, we might have been a Neanderthal planet as opposed to a Homo sapien planet. You know, our African roots might have betrayed us if we if things kept getting colder instead of getting warmer. There's a interesting case to be made that you have the north areas of the old world really aren't occupied until like 35, 40,000 years ago, something like that. And that's only because things are starting to kind of warm up a little You're bit. talking about modern day Norway? I'm talking about even the top half of Russia and Europe. So, like, North Europe and stuff isn't really occupied by Homo sapiens until 30, some odd, 40, some odd thousand like years Spain ago. Spain is cold. Spain is actually an outlier. Spain, we have hominids out there, but but that's the regulated. It's beautiful. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, maybe we wouldn't have won if the climate had not lined up just perfect for us to be able to, to outcompete everybody else. Who knows? It's just such an interesting thought to think wow, how different would history have been if those groups survived into historical times? There's no reason Denisovans couldn't have survived up into the 1900s someplace in, you know, in Russia or something. And then we were just always fighting with them or yelling at them or we had weird racial slurs. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, just, that was just the way it was. And think how much harder it would be for creationists if we had all of these other species along with us. It's a weird fluke of history that we're the only thing that looks like us. We're the only upright walking ape. The closest thing to us is a chimpanzee in the middle of the Congo that doesn't actually look that much like us. But if you were to take all of these other dozens of hominid species that are intermediaries or very similar or whatever, it would be really hard to make the whole we, we're different than animals argument. It'd be hard to have creationists in a world where when you went to the zoo, there are Neanderthals crying and yeah. saying, help, let me out. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm trying to hand their child over the fence. Maybe you can have a better life, please. <laughs> all right. On to article number two. We took a picture. Well, kind of. All right, so this is, of course, the biggest science story of the week, uh, the picture of a black hole for the first time ever. I'm interested for more. I don't know why we're waiting. Please, this, this <laughs> is a major scientific discovery. I mean, I know that we can't see it with our eyes, so we, there must have been some other technology used. So we've talked about black holes before. It's basically a point of infinite density. So the way this happens is a star goes nova, a star explodes, and then the forces of gravity that have held that star and all that stuff together essentially collapse it and collapse everything into a single point of infinite density. And this is such a dense point that even light itself cannot escape. As anything crosses what's called the event horizon, which is the area past which you cannot get out, doesn't matter what you are, light, anything, nothing can escape the event horizon. The event horizon gets bigger and bigger based on uh, the size of that black hole, which is size again... Size meaning mass in this case, exactly. right? Exactly. So size would be how much actual material has been absorbed into it. Obviously, 
obviously, if it's a point of infinite density, then it's not a physical size to it. It's basically yeah. how much gravity it has that's pulling stuff in. Right. What's interesting is the center of every galaxy that we've found so far is a supermassive black hole. That is what these guys were looking at. They weren't looking at just a regular black hole that happens when a star collapses. They were looking at one of these supermassive black holes. There are still some very interesting theories on how these form, but we don't really know for sure. All we know is that most galaxies that we can tell have these supermassive black holes. How big? This particular one they were looking at, which is at the center of the Messier 87 galaxy, about 55 million light years away, the mass of it is 6.5 billion times that of our sun billion times yeah and the sun is already like unimaginably large as as a human so like i don't what it's, are we talking it's, about it's here? almost nonsensical right at yeah. this point but it's huge it's way bigger actually than they thought this experiment actually cleared up the size and they thought it was much smaller they, they even said one of the tangent lines on this particular story is when they looked at the actual size of this black hole versus what they thought it was the difference was so shocking to them that they're like we actually have to reassess how big other black holes are because we got mm -hmm. this one so wrong that clearly the information is not that great. Their face looked like uh, a girl who you know sees a penis for the first time versus a girl who sees Dirk Diggler's penis for mm -hmm. the first time. Yeah. You're like, wow, I did not. How is did this going to fit inside me? Did not know. So very, very cool. You might wonder how you can take a picture of something that captures light, which is the reason we've never had a picture of a black hole before. Any light that's going near it essentially gets sucked in. It can never make its way out. But the point is how near. Yeah. Right. Like exactly how the, well. Close technically, to... the event horizon is is well. But even isn't it true that even outside of the event horizon, yes. if, if a photon is moving past it, it will still get sucked in, yes. and so thus we won't be able to see like some some radius outside of the event horizon. So you still the, can't see the event horizon is the point by which nothing can escape. That does not mean that it still can't pull in some or most things that are beyond the event horizon. So yes, nothing we can see within the event horizon. Mostly, you cannot see even a distance outside of the event horizon. I know that space is a vast nothingness, and so maybe, but I mean, shouldn't you be at least be able to see the the borders, like where the event horizon is, or is it just because it's in the vast emptiness of space that you can't see anything? So no, that you can only see something if there's something to be seen, right? Like if I took a picture, would I see like where the the light starts? To, would I see a distortion of the light? Like at least, would I? What light? The flash on the camera I'm using. <laughs> <laughs> well, in this case, there's matter that's spinning around yes. this black hole, right? Yes. So that is like super hot and bright. And so we can get radiation from that for sure. Right. And, and, then, and this isn't photons. These are radio waves that are actually being stimulated as right. this is getting sucked in. And we're not even seeing when that picture you see, which is, you know, it's kind of a blurry black area with this thing kind of surrounding it. What you're actually seeing isn't the event horizon. It's actually an area that's much larger. It's about two and a half times larger called the photon orbit. It is kind of what we were talking about before. It is a much bigger area where for the most part, you're not going to see anything come out. Is it possible? Yes, it's not quite the event horizon. But unless something's aimed right at you at the right direction in the right way and the light is traveling at just the right angle, you're not going to get anything. So that is kind of what we're seeing. We're seeing it pull stuff into itself which is n all photons not like matter like we normally think yes. of it right well like that's further out yep. that it would get sucked in super fast if it weren't further out right so to do this you can't even just look from one place on earth you couldn't go to the you know our really advanced telescope in the mountains in hawaii and go look and see this essentially what you need is a telescope that's the size of the earth so in order to do Because it's so far away, exactly. right? It's and like 55 million light years, you said? Exactly. And think of how you would get resolution, right? How do you get stereo resolution in your head? Well, you have two different eyes that look at something from two different points of view, so you're able to get that resolution. If you close it and you only have one eye, you limit your field of vision. So... In order to do this, think of it like eyeballs, right? You need to have them separated by some distance apart. The only way to do it here on Earth, instead of building one giant telescope, which would be kind of hard to do, they used a bunch of different radio telescopes all synced up with atomic clocks at different points on the Earth to basically act like they are one giant telescope, kind of like your two eyes act to give you stereo vision. That's different totally crazy. It is. It's like your, your telescope is now spinning super fast. Yes. And like it's not always pointed at the thing. Right. You got to like rotate it correctly. It was a massive amount of data at work. It, would, it took 200 scientists in 20 countries about a 
decade to gather all of this information. They synced it up in April of 2017 with eight telescopes. By the way, there are already like two groups who are jumping on the bandwagon, so to speak, and they're like, we want to be in too for the next one. We'll help you take the data. We're going to get even better, clearer pictures of this as time goes on. I and saw a YouTube video where a guy was suggesting we might be able to get video of this at one point because it's, it's like actually changing on like a day-to-day basis, sure. like the shape of it. Yeah, because as you can imagine, something swirling around a yeah. toilet bowl, so to speak. Like that's kind of what they're seeing. But the giantest <laughs> toilet bowl of all time. Yeah, and they looked at this for 10 straight days. So it wasn't just this one. They actually also looked at the supermassive black hole at the center of our own galaxy. They just have not processed that data yet. I imagine it'll be slightly different, slightly harder to. We also have to remember that the size that you need, the size of telescope you need, again, we said it's the size of the Earth, it could have theoretically been much bigger. It just happens to depend on how close that thing is, how large it is, what's going on. And so it might be that when they looked at the center of our own galaxy, it just happened to be that the Earth is the wrong size to be able to see this thing. We will find that out as they continue to process that. But they had to sync it up with these atomic clocks. There was so much data that they like couldn't even upload it. They, there was, it was just like, yeah, I'm sorry, Dropbox won't handle this. We can't do it. <laughs> so they had to like load it up onto hard disks and fly it to a single place to collate all the data. It's a massive amount of data. It's a huge, one of those like big things where the earth gets together and all shakes hands and we're like, yeah. hey, we're going to do something important now. You know, like yep. we're going to go, we're going to get rid of smallpox. Like we're going to do it. <laughs> and we just decided we're going to take a look at a black hole. Now, again, the picture you see isn't a real picture because no light can escape. Instead, it is a... It's like a caricature. Like yeah. uh, they got uh, they got several of these scientists from around the world drawn like the black holes like riding a race car. <laughs> they got uh, the, the cowboy guy, hat yeah, on. They, they got a guy from Epcot Center who sat there with the big easel and then you know he and by the way they always pull the same thing which is a really shady move you know they don't say to the parents would you like a drawing of your kid they go to the kid and say would you like a drawing so they bother the parent it's the same thing he went to the he went to one of the scientists like hey you want a drawing of that black hole and the scientists turned to their funders and went can we please can we. <laughs> It's going to take 10 years, and this guy's going to fucking just I'll never ask us. for anything again, I promise. <laughs> Fine, black hole. Have your character drawn. The data that we got is microwaves, right? So it it is actually, I mean, it's not a photograph. Yeah. Well, it's not a visible photograph. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we are still detecting electromagnetic radiation. Yeah, absolutely. Think of it like uh, like when we have infrared cameras, right? You're not actually seeing that light. You're, you're, you're getting heat signatures that you're transferring into a visual pattern so we can recognize it. Right. It's a, it's a similar thing. And you might look at it. If you look at the actual picture, you'll notice it's not uniform around. It's lopsided. And we yeah. kind of have that part around the bottom. The reason is the way that that is spinning When you think about this, you go, yeah, fucking course it is. Because the way that's spinning isn't 100% perpendicular to our viewpoint, right? That's what you would have to have to have a perfect circle around. Instead, it's tilted a little bit. So that kind of bulky part that you see at the bottom is just because we are looking at it. Think of like Saturn's rings, right? You're not looking at the planet so you see Saturn's rings perfectly from the uh, from the top down. You're looking at it from an angle so the bottom part, the part that's facing you, looks bigger, the rings that are looking out. But that would be a uniform accretion disk around it if you were looking at the right plane. So very interesting stuff, and they are going to be coming out with one of our own supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy pretty soon. That will also be pretty cool, but this would be just one of those things that will be kind of a neat thing to peruse through your kid's physics textbook in 10 years and kind of see this just in there. Do black holes last forever, or do they fizzle themselves out at some point? Good question. So that's there's the idea that black holes do have a radiation, a Hawking radiation, in which they essentially lose their matter. But there is some disputes as to whether or not that works and how, how all of that works. But the real answer is we're not sure, but smart people tell us probably. Pro- as in probably they will last forever? No, probably they will fizzle out. Right. Yeah. So like... What I've heard is that, like, the heat death of the universe, it mm-hmm. will be when Hawking radiation removes itself from every black hole, and then yeah. nothing I, I don't know so how... be the last things to die. See, yeah. I'm really good at basic mechanics and physics, but when it gets to the super hard, <laughs> like, complicated stuff, I'm like, eh, I don't know about all this shit. Yeah. Uh, I still don't understand how that happens, because it seems to me, like, how is that shit escaping from such a strong gravitational field? Like, you would need energy to escape. I don't get it. But again, I also recognize that there are people who know shit way more than I do, and I'll just leave it to the smart people. <laughs> yeah. With your love of mechanics, why haven't we made the jump to engineering faction? Choo-choo, let's capitalize on those big <laughs> autistic bucks. All right, thank you, audience, for coming back for Engineering Faction 318, where you <laughs> learned about the origin of plants. 
a new hominid discovery in the Philippines, and how he took a picture of a black hole. Thank you so much for joining us, and come on back this Thursday for Science Faction 319. Researchers could tell it was a Filipino hominid because it instantly tried to marry an American serviceman. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right.